Well, I don't know how I found Betty. It was, as some people say, they had good fortune that most, all of it was luck. But my father conditioned me in, in many ways. First of all, he and his family tied, they, they were quite aware. I think he's what my fifth grandfather, fourth grandfather immigrated from England, brought his whole family. By luck or laziness or good fortune, and <clears throat> there have been no broken marriages in my father's family. I was the last of my family, of my siblings, to get married. And my father was so proud of being English, and he liked brunettes. He liked intelligent girls. So he conditioned me for Betty because she was a outstandingly female-looking woman, beautiful, educated, and British. And there was no way out for me. <laughs> I... The other example that my mother and father set for me was that they lived through the loss of three children as infants, four sons away during the war, one as a prisoner of war in Germany for a long time. Growing up with hard times on the farm, no cash, not an easy life, and in all the time that I was underfoot as a child, I never heard a crossword between them. Never. It wasn't done. There might have been some serious discussions at one time, but I never heard it. And we were treated, you know, my father was the authority figure, but I remember he spanked me once. As a little preschooler, I had found my father's hatchet that he used on his trapping, you know, for setting traps, for tra fur trapping. And he had a high drying shed with beams, with, with uh, long, uh, wooden beams supporting the edges. It was just a big farm shed. Well, I had very carefully chopped away at one of those beams until it almost cut it through with his hatchet. And then, so proud of myself, had gone to my mother and told her, you know, I chopped that thing. <laughs> and she didn't think it was funny. And she told me, you better go see your dad about that. So I knew I was in big trouble. Being sent to my dad was, that's the Supreme Court. I went to him and he said, oh boy, yes, you've, you've done that, have you? He said, do you think you should get a spanking? I said, yes, sir. And what could you say? And he said, well, go get me a switch. I ran away very frantically looking for a switch. And the only thing I could find was under the pear trees was a shillelagh. And I brought that back to him and turned around and waited for the, for the death stroke. And I, nothing happened. And I turned and looked looked up at him, and he had his hand covering his face like this, and I didn't know it at the time. He was trying to control his laughter. <laughs> so he just bumped me with it a couple of times, and he said, is that enough? And I said, yes, I was gone. It took me years to figure out the poor guy was laughing his head off <laughs> at the chalet. And brother. And I was terrified. My father was a kind and gentle man. He couldn't, you could not be, to any animal on the farm or to a dog, you couldn't be cruel. He would not allow it. So that's, that's my background, and, and there was, there's never been a consideration of, you know, she was the one. Had I not met her, I might have had a trouble. <laughs>
original, what do you call it, virgin pine timber, huge pine trees. The lumber company came in and developed and put one way, we called them dummy lines, one way rail lines back into the forest, loaded the trees, took them to the sawmill locally, and the area prospered for a few decades. We had acetylene lights on the house. We had a fancy buggy that I never saw in my time, but it was before my time. Pa was able to send the two oldest boys away to university. We had telephones, in which you, you the old crank magneto phones on party lines. I, the, those were still around, but not operating when I grew up. After the timber left, the economy went just dead and continued through the Depression and never really changed until well after World War II. We were no paved roads or anything. My parents never owned a car. Uh, we don't learn from history. The first depression started from mismanagement and greed. We're now in a, but at that time we had no safety net, no social security, no unemployment, anything like that. Now we have, we've put band-aids on the problem but haven't fixed the original problem. We have a, a crisis in medical care. We who have Social Security and Medicaid, Medicare have full medical care. We have high technology medicine, emergency room medicine, no equal in the world, but the, our mortality rate, our infant mortality rate, our longevity does not match. We ranked way down in the 20s and low, the 27th to the 30s in industrialized countries, just ahead of Cuba in infant mortality and life expectancy. We have not applied the learning, the experience we've had. We have not applied the technology. We overutilize the technology for marketing purposes. We do not apply it to, as in preventive medicine and in education. So we're bumbling along. We, we avoided this last a major recession because we had learned a little, but we don't remember history. We, we had this totally abundant country with big oceans between us and a potentially aggressive enemies. We've had a free ride, and we better catch on soon and start solving some problems. I have, I've had a good life. Betty and I would have made it wherever we were, but seeing the people from Indonesia working on the boat, they're nine months on that boat sending, and they're working for Indonesian dollars, they're not paying in euros, sending all that money's going back to Indonesia. Those are people for whom there's little, if any, hope. I mean, just holding their own. I'm concerned about Beth and Nathan and, and Danielle having a positive future. It's going to be a global economy. They're going to have to compete na nationally. And we still have the advantages of abundance in our country. We just have to make some, ad some adaptations. We're not doing it. Our Obama, to me, is a great leader with wonderful potential. It just means so much to me that he is president with his intelligence and philosophy. But our what we call blue dog Democrats, the conservative Democrats, are in the, the Democrats are in the majority. All they have to do is lead now, and they're not doing it. But I'm an optimist. <laughs> That's, that wasn't optimism you heard. It's grim. But we, we, you know, starting where I did, being barefoot on the farm and you know, having siblings die of polio, things have. Things have improved. I just hope it continues for my children's children.